working on a project for over a year, and that was the idea of reimagining the solo Immediate Tragedy that is one of those lost Martha Graham solos that we recently discovered a lot of new material about. A letter that I discovered that Martha Graham wrote to Henry Cowell, who uh, wrote the original music for Immediate Tragedy. I think you and I are a success, she writes to Henry Cowell. Everyone was very moved by the new dance. It is called Immediate Tragedy a dance of dedication. I feel driven, compelled, and energized. It sounds very well with instruments. I thought of you while I danced it. I felt in that dance, immediate tragedy, that I was dedicating myself anew to space, and that in spite of violation, I was upright, and that I was going to stay upright at all costs. It's uh, dedicated to the Spanish women, of the era and that what they were grappling with with the Spanish Civil War. It was created the same year that Picasso was working on Guernica. The son of a photographer came to us, uh, Douglas Fraser came and said, my father, Robert Fraser, happened to be sitting in the front row of a Martha Graham performance in 1937. I've discovered these canisters of film as I was cleaning out his effects and would you like to have them? Because we had the, the rolls of film, we had the contact sheets, we knew the order of the poses that were in the photos. We have 14 dancers. Um, for the first dancer, she got four photos and the fourth photo became the first photo for the second dancer. I assigned them first, each to create a slow phrase using these four photos and to create a fast phrase of about 30 seconds. And from there, we asked for a phrase that would uh, repeat on itself. So it was six threes that could then just start right again uh, on the first three and happen and accelerate and accelerate and accelerate. And we also assigned a phrase where they would choose their favorite phrase that they created and choose their favorite phrase that someone else created and put them together. So we began to have overlapping material um, that they uh, danced a little differently, of course, but the same basic moves. One of the big joys of participating is seeing my coworkers dance again. It was kind of the first time we got to come together and we saw these clips really fresh and new of everyone's innovation and choreography. And that was just, it's really special. It was nice to really have something to do every day and just to see what our, what the fellow dancers came up with. We're like, oh, that's, yeah. I wouldn't have thought about that. Martha, I consider her technique something that she created based on like her own inner emotion. So I wanted the emotion to be like really important and uh, really tried to incorporate more emotion than technique in my plays. The next thing that uh, that was quite a challenge for you, Janet, I know, and you really tackled it, was you know the sense of dancers moving through space. Um, and this is a good moment to um, talk about the sky cam. One of the things that our research uncovered was this what we've been calling the sky cam map. It's a staging map of Martha Graham dancing the solo, immediate tragedy. And Arch Lauderer, who was a lighting designer, stage designer, who was at Bennington and saw the premiere evidently sat with his pencil on a piece of paper and just drew a line without lifting his pencil as to where Martha was moving on the stage. It starts in the upper left-hand corner, so we know that she entered from stage right and moved down stage on a diagonal and zigzagged up stage. So initially, I thought, oh ha, this is, this is part of the ephemera that we should put into our mm -hmm. new digital immediate tragedy. So along with the dancers for photos, I said, Dancer A, your phrase should move on a diagonal from upstage right to downstage left. Dancer B, you should be doing a zigzag uh, upstage move. You know, just naively thinking that somehow this was all gonna come together like it does on stage. It was, it was 
an assumption of mine that, um, you know, it was like the light bulb going off. That we weren't going to have a big stage space, that, that diagonals on a, on a screen look completely different than the diagonal on a stage, um, that the depth of field doesn't matter, whereas um, the edges of the box become very important. So I had to completely shift my thinking. Janet and Chris, you met uh, a couple of years ago at the Soraya on a piece called Martha Graham and American Music. Uh, but for those who are not tracking that subject, Janet, tell us a little bit more about uh, Martha's collaborations with composers. Yes, Martha had a very particular relationship with music. Um, rather than finding a piece of music and then illuminating it, as uh, many choreographers do, uh, her music director, Louis Horst, taught her that her own physical statement should be the center of the art that she was creating, and that then music should be commissioned to frame and enhance what she was doing. We searched our archives and, and found uh, sheet music from Henry Cowell. The sheet music was not for immediate tragedy. It was for Deep Song, uh, another solo about the Spanish uh, Civil War. When you sent those, the manuscript for, for um, Deep Song, you know, it's a pretty incredible thing to look at, um, mostly because nobody really knows this music. It's not really part of his catalog. And then there's this kind of uh, intermediate percussion music, which is music that would have connected Deep Song to immediate tragedy. And it gives the tempo of, um, of for, for the first part of the percussion piece, and it says kind of tempo of Deep Song. And then in the second part of the piece, it gives a tempo marking and it says tempo of the Saraband, which is the tempo of the immediate tragedy. So we don't have the score to immediate tragedy at all, at, at all but we do have this kind of beautiful link. Um, so I looked at all those kind of rhythms from that little link and I thought, okay, well, there are three or four rhythms here that I can kind of, and, and it's simply just unpitched percussion. It's gongs and uh, membrana phones, it's um, some drums uh, and a few wood blocks. And so seeing those rhythms and kind of looking at that contour and thinking, okay, so whatever the contour of the beginning of the piece at least, um, the, it must match this contour of this percussion part. And perhaps a couple of the rhythms I can kind of take and, and appropriate those rhythms for this piece. We have amazing players in Wild Up. Um, these are some of my closest friends and people I've been making music with for a decade now. Um, Gigi is our, is our guitarist. She's an amazing kind of uh, electric guitarist, but trained as a classical guitarist. Richard Balatudo is our pianist, uh, specializes in new music, but also he's a master of like going inside the piano and doing techniques in the piano. Brian Walsh is our clarinet player. He plays clarinet, bass clarinet, and saxophones. And on this, he plays both B-flat clarinet and bass clarinet. Uh, Jody Landau is an incredible improviser and composer. He's a vocalist. He sings only about 10 bars on this on, on immediate tragedy, but he also plays a, uh, an instrument called the harpeggi, um, which is quite a modern instrument. Um, that's amplified. He plays synth and some uh, marimba and vibraphone. Um, and then Derek Stein is our cellist, a remarkable cellist uh, and specializes in new music. All of them are improvisers. All of them are composers. And we're used to working on a, a certain type of music making called open score, which is where we are given a set of material that's relatively simplistic and we all kind of build on it and make it something. And also it means any part of the score you can kind of grab as your own. The way we started, we thought, okay, well, so we're all dealing with um, like the, the, the modern conference meeting. So we're dealing with Zoom or we're dealing with Skype or whatever. So what if we tried to make a piece where we each call and respond to each other? So we tried this over Zoom and immediately what happens is even when we all try to just slate the track so we're all together, you know, if we all try to clap at the same time, which was our first test, it's like three, two, one, that's that's our that's our baseline that's how together we'll be at our absolute most together and and we thought okay well what music works in that way so big masses of chords big masses of sound work very well a melody where um part of the melody is very busy and then part of the melody is just one note and perhaps we can use latency to show possibility so there's 21 creative people plus a video editor on a Zoom about six weeks ago. And all the things we just talked about, the history, the newly discovered photographs, um, our desire to do something in our remote locations. Uh, and then like billiard balls, you know, literally the work scatters to every corner of the globe. And there is a moment early on where all 21 artists 
are both working independently in their homes and by virtue of these sort of uh, prompts they've been given and the check-ins that you have on video conference, collaborating as well. Like it's, it's the most unique combination of independent work and group work all at once. And so I, just, I, I wanna point out that all of your artists, Chris, your musicians and Janet, your dancers, have to be really independent-minded, collaborative, creative people at the height of their of their their skill set and form to be able to to do this because you you know you can't be in the room together and that that can't be uh, emphasized enough of what an extraordinary undertaking that is. What do you think she meant by um, dance of dedication? I think she meant that when you are committed to a cause, whether it's dance or whether it's a revolution. I mean, she was creating a revolution that you dedicated yourself to it completely.